Well, our guest today needs no introduction. We have with us Dr. Temple Brandon, world famous animal scientist, autism self advocate, author, and speaker. In fact, she's coming to Greenville, South Carolina for the Springbrook Autism Behavioral Health um, National Converge Autism Summit on April 29th of this year. And her topic is The Way I See It. Um, welcome to the show today, Dr. Grandin. Well, it's really good to be here. So you're, um, I have a book by the same title that you've written, The Way I See It. What are some of the things that you'll be sharing at the summit this year? Well, I've got a lot of things we're going to share. It was my understanding that the, the uh, main uh, biggest thrust of this summit was to adult transition. Yes. And so I'll be talking about that. Now, the way I see it book covers everything from early intervention uh, through, you know, adult issues. It's kind of my most general book on autism. A lot of little short chapters. You don't have to read the whole thing. You can kind of pick and choose. But what I've been seeing is we're doing a good job with the little kids, getting little kids started, early intervention. But then where I see things kind of uh, falling behind is adult transition. I'm seeing too many kids that are not learning work skills. It works best to have a slow transition from the world of school to the world of work. And that starts with things like with my generation with paper routes. Now I know that's gone, but I've talked to a lot of grandparents who find out they're on the spectrum when the kids get diagnosed. And these would be the type where there's no speech delay, you know, the old Asperger type. And they had paper routes. So we need to start doing things to replace paper routes at around age 11. How about volunteer jobs outside the home on a schedule? They could be at a church or a community center or maybe a senior home. Something where somebody outside the family is a boss. Instant, they're legal. They need to get real jobs. And I see too many parents overprotecting their kids. I'm just appalled at the huge numbers of fully verbal teenagers. And I talk to the parents and the kid has never gone shopping by themselves has not ordered food themselves in a restaurant. Just very, very basic skills like this, things that I was doing in elementary school. I think, I don't know if it's a, a one of your books or an article, but you talk about that gentle push. Can you talk about the importance of, of course, we don't that's want to- the, That's the book I did with Deborah Moore called The Loving Push. Okay. So and one of the that. big uh, problems I'm seeing is kids are getting addicted to video games. We've got to limit the video game playing. If these students were getting fabulous jobs in the video game industry, I would not be criticizing this. But that's not what's happening. And there have been some successful weaning off of video games with the three young adults with car mechanics. Because my kind of mind, the visual thinker, um, tends to like video games, also tends to like you know mechanical things. Um, but what I'm seeing with fully verbal, that have normal speech, young adults, well, we can either go to the basement or the bedroom, play video games, or we get out and we have a life. And this is what I'm seeing. I'm kind of, it's either one or the other. And I've talked to parents where they got their kid out in a good job. And I've heard this word over and over again. He blossomed, she bloomed, she really developed. And I have seen that. And they get out and, and get out in the real world. And that's what we need to do. Now, I want to warn you, um, uh, let's avoid jobs with tons of multitasking. Super crazy McDonald's takeout window. That's not where you put them. The other thing is, I cannot remember long strings of verbal information. All right, let's say it's closing out a cash drawer in a store. Give me a pilot's checklist. Step one, step two, step three, step four, written bullet points. And all the guys got to disclose is pilots need a checklist. I need them too. And that's all the disclosure you have to do. But if I had to um, close out a cash drawer, when I first started out, I would need to make a little checklist. And then after I'd done it for a few weeks, I can throw the checklist away. Because then I will have videotaped the whole procedure into my head. Those are just very, very simple things um, that can be very helpful. Parents, employers get hard. Well, I showed him how to clean the ice cream machine five times. Is he stupid? Right. I've heard that. Uh, checklist, bullet points of the steps for taking the machine apart, cleaning it, and putting it back together. Some students and young adults on the spectrum have a hard time getting past the interview. There are kids and young adults. Short circuit that. Short circuit it. Short circuit it. Get in the back door. Just short circuit it. 
Now, the way I got jobs, I had a little sign painting business when I was in high school. And I simply showed people a portfolio of my signs. And then when I started doing um, uh, uh, cattle handling facilities, I simply showed off my drawings. I'll show you some right now. I learned to sell my work. I didn't sell myself. I sold my work. I sh and these drawings are in thinking and pictures. No, we need to grease those skids, get in the back door, especially for jobs like entry level jobs, like grocery store or something like that. Uh, you got to make it happen. You just got to make it happen. Half of all good jobs are back door. Half of all good jobs for everybody is back door, just through contacts and friends. There's been some very good um, uh, jobs with car dealerships selling cars especially for the kid who is a verbal thinker, not a picture thinker like me, but a verbal thinker, because that kid will know every car on that lot and every detail about it. Specialized retail, another really good job. Will you talk a little bit more about the different kinds of thinkers? You're saying that you're a, a picture thinker. So will you give us a little rundown of the different types of thinkers? Okay, I'm what's called an object visualizer. And in my book, The Autistic Brain, I reviewed some of the older research. I actually got a new book coming out next fall. It's already up on Amazon for pre-orders and it's called Visual Thinking. And you have to use my name to search for it, Temple Grandin Visual Thinking. But I'm what's called an object visualizer. And there's been research on this. Everything I think about is a specific photorealistic picture. Absolutely can't do algebra. Still can't do algebra. Then you have the mathematical mind. This is your autistic kid, the little math geniuses that can just figure out how to look at the math and do it without showing any steps. And they need to be moved ahead in math. And then you've got the kid that loves history, loves facts, loves maybe baseball statistics, and knows all the facts about their favorite thing. Now let's look at the jobs for the different kinds of minds. My kind of mind, it's going to be art, another big area is photography, a really big area. I have a lot of, you know, uh, TV crews and stuff, interview main movie crews. I've talked to a lot of photographers, good 20% of them are autistic, dyslexic, or ADHD. And then the other big job is mechanics. I'm going to estimate that 20% to of the people I worked with that owned large metal businesses, inventing equipment with autistic, dyslexic, or ADHD. Then you have your mathematical thinker. That's your Silicon Valley computer guy. And of course, everybody knows Elon Musk is autistic. Um, and what's important to him is Tesla cars and rockets because light, there was a gigantic full color spread. First page business section, Wall Street Journal of all the mansions he sold. That just didn't matter. No, rather go live in a box of all at the spaceport because a spaceport and Tesla's, that's what matters. And then you've uh, then your word thinkers. These are the ones that would be good at things like specialized retail, um, anything with record keeping, accounting, uh, these kinds of jobs, uh, uh, a lot of detail. Also, I forgot to tell you, the mathematical minds often are good at music, pattern thinking. Music and math goes together. And I'm a big believer in getting kids exposed to lots of different things. My ability in art was always encouraged. And I was exposed to musical instruments. I never could figure out how to play one. But another kid, you expose them to a guitar, they're going to just take off with it. And too many kids today don't get a chance to get exposed to tools and, and, and all the skilled trade stuff. Because a lot of my kind of mind, those are perfect jobs. They'll have jobs for life. These jobs are not going to go away. Electrician, huge shortage right now. Fixing the electrical wires, uh, and all kinds of mechanical stuff, mechanics. One, um, I've heard you speak on several occasions, and you mentioned that a big mistake that the public school system made was getting rid of trade type classes and just a total push just towards college. That some of that gap that's there in our trades. You feel like a lot. Well, I think it was a big mistake. Now the community colleges have picked this up, but the, and they're doing a good job. But the problem is, it's too late. We need to be hooking these kids earlier. I took wood shop in elementary school. I was using tools in second grade. 
no screwdriver, hammer, hammer, and pliers. Saws weren't allowed at that point. You know, I'm taught to use them carefully. Uh, but I'm seeing too many kids, smart kids, getting shunted aside um, because the school doesn't want their test scores messed up. Now, I know this is very different in different states. Some states are better than others. But we need our skilled trades people. We have, we have a huge loss of skills right now. You know, who's going to keep the power grid from falling apart? I mean, there's some serious problems, and I'm going to be covering that in the new book on visual thinking, uh, because I'm really appalled as I go back and forth between the autism world and the industrial world. And there's a connection here. Most educators just don't get it. Sometimes people get confused with the IQ because someone has a high IQ, maybe pushing towards um, college versus what you're saying. If there's a visual thinking or some other kind of thinking, some other job, no matter what their IQ or education, how, whatever they're doing is great. A good, a good college degree for visual thinkers, industrial design. That's the visual side of engineering. But I can tell you right now, there's an awful lot of engineering. I did a lot of engineering. I'm very careful not to use the title. I wasn't allowed to. I always wrote livestock handling consultant, always. And there's people labeled draftsmen. They're designing entire factories. And, and they write draftsmen because they have to. It's the visual side of engineering. And I don't think you want to hear a whole talk about industry right now. But I, I and, and that photography is the other thing. I don't know how many movie photographers I've talked to. Not so much the producers and stuff, but just the people that, you know, do the cameras. They're very, very good. They were the dyslexic kid who got introduced to cameras. You know, photography's a great field, and it's a really good field to do freelance businesses. And maybe is it the word thinker, um, the researcher, the archivist, the... Yeah, oh, the word thinker would be, a word thinker would be really good librarian be a, uh, archiving um they'd be really good at that anything specialized retail office supplies they'd know every printer in the store and pick the right printer out for you not just shove the biggest most expensive one down your throat and and people would appreciate that you know i, spe I call that specialized retailing like, there's auto parts store was another success story he knew every part in the store. He didn't have to use the computer. They loved him. It's getting that chance through the back door. Well, we got to get those chances through the back door. And the, there's, a, there's a scene in the movie where I go up and I get the editor's card. Because I knew if I wrote for that magazine, that would help my career. And I want to thank my teachers in elementary school and middle school for marking my papers up and making me write book reports. Because writing is something I do know how to do. And it was extremely important, it still is extremely important. So you, you mentioned in the beginning that um, they're doing a pretty good job out there in the professional world and educator world, maybe for the, the younger um, kids on the spectrum. And then it's middle school, high school, adults, there's, there's kind of this fall off of um, publications, resources, um, things for parents because things are so focused on the young kids. What kind of... Well, let's, look, let's get more creative just in the neighborhood. And I'm always seeing things. I remember on, on my book company, I used to have a warehouse, had a little warehouse place. And in the same building was the coolest custom motorcycle shop. I actually went in and talked to them. And I look at that and I go, I know certain kids I'd like to place in there. That would be the thing that could get them off the building custom bikes. You see, I just see those sort of things. The doors are everywhere and people aren't seeing them. You know, people that work for tech companies have tags hanging around their neck, advertising who they work for. Maybe you go up and show your kids programming. Somebody with a tag hanging around their neck at the grocery store. You see, as a visual thinker, I, I see it. Oh, here's a success story. I was on an airplane just last week, and um, and the dad of an autistic kid was on it. He says, oh man, my kid's loving his job. He started loading bags for one of the major airlines. Well, I'm gonna leave the name of the airline out of it, because this is real reason. Uh, he's loving it. He had to load bags, got to pay his dues, but now he's doing all the jobs, fueling, de-icing, everything to do with the ground on the plane he's doing. And I'm sure he has to do toilet truck too. And he's loving it. 
He is an expert on all groundwork around big jets. Isn't that cool? That's a real job I just heard about last week. But you got to pay your dues, loading bags, getting that baggage hold, knee pads on. It's not fun. I've watched him do it. I think that's a common problem, whether someone is neurotypical or neurodiverse. The younger generation has a hard time with those start out jobs that aren't necessarily well, the thing have you want to do. do. Well, I'll tell you one thing, it ain't fun. Loading bags in CRJ, little tiny airplane, you're on your hands and knees in there. Nothing fun about that. But in a lot of jobs, and I've seen this in the meat industry, I've seen people get a job on the line, learn every job on the line, and then gravitate towards the maintenance department. Next thing you know, 15 years later, they're project manager for the new plant edition. I've seen that. I've been on those projects. But you have to pay your dues. And I've often thought about, what if I was, someone waved a magic wand and I was 18 years old and I'd flunked algebra three times. I lived in the state of California and I couldn't graduate from high school. But, well, but they didn't take my knowledge away. I had my knowledge. I'm 18 years old, dirt poor. I'll tell you where I'd go, straight for the Amazon warehouse. I have a goal. I want to get in their rocket program or I want to design the warehouse of the future. But they're going to put me to work unloading a truck and I'm going to have to pay my dues and I'm going to have to run around on that floor and be a really good picker. And I got that scanner that measures me. Now I've learned that you don't want to be the best picker because the other employees will hate your guts. So I want to be, and I'll watch the figures, I want to be like right about 85th percentile. I want to be really good, but not so good that the other employees don't like me. That's yeah. a little social thing that I've learned. I think, I think Sydney here has learned that. She likes to be that achiever, top achiever person. <laughs> but on the other hand, way. I've got a goal. Um, then the next thing a robot breaks off, I'll, I'll help them fix it. You see, then I'm going to be fixing robots. Then the next thing you know, I'm going to be designing. But you see, I already know about a career path that's possible. That's the thing. That's part of the problem is a lot of the kids, even though an IEP in public school is supposed to help someone transition from high school into the world of work, there's not a lot of what's your skill set, what's your passion, and really helping form I know her IEP said plans to go to college. I mean, that was her transition. And, but that's that. But the thing is, the big problem today, kids aren't getting exposed to enough stuff. Um, horses were my passion. I had to be exposed to them. And this brings up another thing, friends through shared interests. I had friends with horses. We also had a model rocket club. I had some friends in that and electronics. Friends through shared interests but you have to be exposed to those things. And this was in high school, to get interested in them. Kids aren't getting exposed to enough stuff to develop interests or to find out what they're good at. If a kid's good at math, let's move my head. Let them take college math in third grade. I'm not gonna recommend putting them in college. That'd be bad, but give them a laptop, online college math class, third grade classroom, just fine. Don't give me a reason why you can't do it because the reason's BS. Oh, get and that the reminds me of the Uber driver All right. the airport. You see, I always remember specific examples. Long, hour and a half long trip to the airport. And he worked as a, he, he had a part-time job at a community college teaching computer programming. It was his kid, third or fourth grade. He fought the school. And he finally, the kid now does high school math in a third or fourth grade classroom, doing great. That wasn't hard. Don't give me a reason not to do it. He needs to be in the third grade for social. And when and during math class, he does his online class and they send it in to the instructor and the teacher is keep, you know, keeping in touch with the, with the high school math instructor. See, make sure he's doing okay. Doing fine. Don't give me, give me a reason why he can't do it because it's BS. So with, with the spectrum being kind of deep and wide and there are, you know, different IQ levels, speaking, non-speaking, verbal, non-verbal. Well, that's right. And even, even your non-speaking, some of them can type totally independently. They describe problems with controlling movement, problems with vision scrambled up. Um, we need to be looking at what they can do. They also know the difference between real work and fake work. 
and they get frustrated when they have to do a lot of stupid, busy work that doesn't mean anything. The other big problem I'm seeing with employment is a lot of counselors don't differentiate to where maybe bagging groceries is an appropriate career. And for someone like me, it would be an appropriate training job for one summer, not an appropriate career. People are not making that that uh, distinction. I and I, I, I like the can-do. I'm really glad I got to watch the end of the Paralympics. I had to see people that were, um, you know, paraplegics doing slalom skiing, the very clever single ski piece of equipment. That was really cool. That's showing what you can do. Sled hockey, you know, then the summer games, it's wheelchair basketball. You know, I like, I like the can-do stuff. I'm really glad I had a, I watched that the other night for almost two hours. I think sometimes people misunderstand or believe because someone is non-speaking that they um, aren't capable of doing other things. So you're kind of talking about looking at what a person can do, and I think maybe presuming competence first. Well, that's right. And I've just been talking to people that run bittersweet farms where they take in a lot of the nonverbal um, individuals. And a lot of those people really thrive in outdoor jobs on a farm where they get a lot of, you know, uh, work that works their muscles and it's real work. And they do really well in that. And they know the difference between real work and fake busy work.